Hi, my name is Daniel Kitts. I'm a producer with The Agenda with Steve Bacon, and we are joined today by Janice Stein, the director of the Monk School for Global Studies, and of course, TVO's longtime foreign affairs analyst. Janice, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you. And Daniel, it is the Monk School of Global Affairs. What did I say? Studies. Of oh, I'm so sorry, Janice. That's I, all I, was right. that up. I still remember the. Um, the it's monk center designation so i yeah. i was had that uh, we have evolved and grown and gotten bigger and have many more students and that's why our name changed absolutely so well let's start with that then since we're talking about the monk school let's give you some uh, publicity what's uh, what's the latest going on at the monk school that uh, you'd want to highlight for our viewers well, we have um, some wonderful students who are about to head out for internships. Uh, and actually, if you go to our website, Daniel, you will see an interactive map uh, of all the places where our students are in China, in Japan, in India, at the World Trade Organization, at the World Bank. Uh, just, uh, I think, for Canadians, so encouraging to know that our young people are going out into the world, learning, engaging, and then coming back to do really interesting things in this country and for this country. Interesting. Maybe find out more about that on uh, your website. Yes. Great. Well, I'll uh, ask Naveen Vaswani, who's uh, uh, helping me out t today by managing the chat, if at some point, uh, when you have a moment, Naveen, maybe you could post the uh, Monk School Center's website uh, URL uh, to the chat so people interested can take a look at that. That would be great. Um, absolutely great. Well, um, let's, uh, we're all obviously hoping to get some questions from our viewers today about international affairs, uh, and, but let's start a little bit with what has been sticking out for me as sort of the top story at the start of the week in the world is the situation in Mali. Um, the French have decided to intervene. Uh, it is obviously a former French colony, Mali is, but uh, why do you think the French have, have decided to really take the lead here in a way that no other country has? You know, Daniel, this was a situation that just unrolled literally in real time. Let me go back for just a minute uh, and fill in some of the recent history. Um, after uh, the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya, uh, many fighters who were African who had come to the assistance of the Libyan regime fanned back out into Africa but equipped with all kinds of sophisticated weapons uh, that leaked out of Libya. In northern Mali, uh, many of these fighters gathered uh, and made common cause with the Tuareg minority who had all, who've had historic grievances. Uh, against the regime in Mali. The real tragedy here is that this was uh, one of the shining lights uh, in democratic governance uh, in Africa. We in Canada have given uh, over $100 million worth of development assistance to Mali in the effort really to promote responsible and democratic governance. Uh, when these two groups came together, uh, Islamic militants coming out of Libya and joined forces with the Tuareg. Uh, they took control of a large part of northern Mali, uh, half, more than half the country, although very sparsely populated. As soon as that happened, young officers in southern Mali overthrew the democratically elected government, uh, a military uh, junta took over. The international community uh, turned on this government since it had overthrown a democratically elected government, cut off assistance. They handed over power to a civilian as a prime minister, but the damage had really been done. So in the north now, you have a, I think it is fair to say, a very militant regime. Uh, that is cutting off the hands of those charged uh, with thievery. It is whipping uh, women who are, by their standards, improperly dressed. Uh, so this um, is a regime that is way 
uh, to one end of the spectrum, frankly. And thousands and thousands of people living in the cities in that area fled uh, to southern Mali. In the south, you have a government that is still, in fact, military-backed, uh, and you have a standoff. Now, looking around, the rest of Africa is alarmed uh, by the consolidation of power by Islamic militants, by Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, as they're called. This is the group, by the way, that kidnapped Robert Fowler uh, and Louis Gay, two Canadian diplomats, held them hostage for over 130 days. Uh, they're alarmed and they have pushed hard. The UN Security Council approved a resolution to use force to intervene and remove uh, the Islamic group. Nine months, uh, at least a year probably, to organize this African force, uh, to arm it, to equip it, to support it, and to train it. Well, if you were the Islamic militants, you wouldn't sit around uh, and wait for that to happen, and not surprisingly, they didn't. And about 10 days ago, they launched a real offensive. Moving south and overran one town, Kone, and threatened at least two others. It's that that triggered the French intervention. It was clear uh, that in order, in order really for the government in Bamako, the capital of Mali in the south, to survive, um, somebody would have to do something fairly quickly. This is a, a former French colony. Uh, the French put uh, 800 special forces on the ground literally within 48 hours, uh, used aircraft to bomb and push the Islamic militants back from one of the towns. Um, at the same time, the militants outflanked the French forces and have now taken control uh, of a town in western Mali. So this is going to be, this is not a surgical intervention. There are no surgical interventions. This is going to be a long struggle. And you're seeing already, Daniel, in France, the kind of conversation we've had in Canada, for instance, about what we did in Afghanistan. What's the purpose of the mission? Is the purpose just to uh, stabilize the government in the south and prevent the Islamic forces from going any further? Uh, and that's it for now. Is the purpose, in fact, to push forward uh, and hunt down uh, the Islamic militants. There's confusion around that. The uh, president of France, uh, François Hollande, has really not clarified the mission. So Le Monde today is full of the kind of arguments that are all too familiar to Canadians. Oh, no, that's very interesting. And, and that actually, uh, we've gotten a question from Twitter by um, Esther Mendelson, and that it sort of relates to what you were just talking about. She expresses a bit of surprise that um, uh, the, the French government, particularly a socialist uh, government that uh, traditionally um, French socialists have been very critical of intervention, at least on the part of the United States and Britain in the past decade or so, that they would be sending troops to Mali and uh, engaging in airstrikes. Uh, how sh surprised should we be that France is, is doing this given some of the politics of the past decade? Well, I think Esther Mendelssohn makes a very good point. Uh, this is certainly not what one would have expected from François Hollande. He was, as you rightly say, in the past very critical. Uh, but we are, I think, um, running up against the traditional French interest in former French Africa. These are governments, the government in Bamako called on the government of France urgently for assistance. And France has had a history under both socialist governments and uh, more right-wing governments of coming to the um, assistance of governments that are under threat. Uh, that's precisely what Hollande did this time. And by the way, his standing in the public opinion polls in France has risen as a result of his decisive action. Now, these are the good days of any intervention in the early days. Um, it's as these interventions stretch out, stretch on, 
without a clear end in sight, um, that it becomes far more challenging. Very interesting. Well, uh, we might return to Molly depending on what our, our viewers ask us. We'll just add, uh, Sorry, yes. I should just add in case any of our viewers are interested um, that Canada has sent one military transport aircraft for one week uh, to Bamako, uh, not directly into the fighting, but to transport either supplies or troops from other African countries. Uh, to Bamako. Uh, we, the British have done, have sent two. The United States is sending logistics and communication. Uh, and we also have trainers uh, in Niger, a neighboring country, uh, preparing for a large scale annual military exercise. Uh, but our Prime Minister has said, um, I think in very clear terms, that we do not intend to put any troops on the ground uh, in Mali here. So France actually is surprisingly quite alone. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a question about a different part of the world. Um, this is from uh, a viewer named Tom, and his question is, with this march being planned by populist cleric Tahir ul Qadri to challenge the government, uh, where do you see things going in Pakistan? And this is an interesting story that just caught my attention recently. Uh, this uh, cleric has gotten a lot of protests uh, or a lot of people out uh, moving against the government in Pakistan. He actually has uh, lived in Toronto and, and yes. is a citizen as well as being uh, a Pakistani citizen. Yes. Uh, what do you make of this development and, and, and how it's going to affect uh, Pakistan's all often unstable politics? Well, you're quite right, Daniel. He is Canadian. Uh, he lived in Canada for a long time uh, and actually was quite low profile. Uh, but recently began to work very hard to uh, organize and mobilize a large protest movement which we saw unfold in Islamabad over the last 72 hours. Uh, this being Pakistan, there is every conceivable explanation for what he's doing. Uh, let's start at the conspiratorial end. Uh, the Qadri is in fact a stalking horse for the military that this is a pretext uh, to give the military a reason to intervene and prevent the elections which are scheduled in Pakistan, uh, that these elections are actually important. It would be the first time that there was a transition from one elected president to his successor or to a re-elected president and that Qadri in fact by mobilizing um, thousands of people in street demonstrations against the corruption um, in Pakistan right now is really just a stalking horse for the military. And there are many in Pakistan uh, committed to democratic governance who otherwise might be very sympathetic to the allegations that Qadri is making, who are nevertheless very worried that in fact the military will use this as an opportunity to intervene. How true is this? Really difficult, frankly, to make a judgment. Qadri has denied this and is saying that the corruption uh, is so offensive uh, in Pakistan that it's time for people to take to the streets and to own their own government. The military has denied this. Uh, time is going to tell, frankly. Hmm. It, is, it raises an interesting question about <clears throat> just how to uh, entrench democracy in, in, in countries that don't have much of a history of it because on the one hand what this man is doing um, is perfectly part of democratic values yes. in Canada. We would expect people to do these sorts of things if they oppose the government, yet in the fragile nature of Pakistan it's seen as possibly detrimental to the cause of democracy. Um, it, I don't, I suppose you have any insight as to when a, a country is kind of at this embryonic stage of democracy, what the best way is to go, whether to allow just for stable transition or to allow people to fully express their rights and, and move and protest in a way that we would allow and expect in Canada. It, it, you actually can't um, prevent peaceful demonstrations. Uh, once you create a legal structure 
which allows the government to prevent peaceful demonstrations. You so compromised the democratic fabric uh, because government can then use those powers and those levers uh, against anybody that is opposed. So I really don't think there's a choice here. As long as the demonstrations remain peaceful, which they did, um, there isn't really a choice in democratic theory. It is true that Pakistan is what we would call a fragile democratic state because it has not had an orderly transition, unlike, by the way, Mali, which did transfer power from one elected government to another and was the repository of so much hope. So even one transfer of power is not enough uh, to bulletproof democracy. Uh, but when you've had none, as you have had, uh, as Pakistan has not had, uh, clearly we're dealing with a very fragile democracy here. And I think that's what's fueling uh, the conspiracy stories that are just rampant in the Pakistani press right now. Mm. Well, we have another question actually going back to Mali uh, from our live chat. Uh, the question is, do you think there's a clear reason for why Mali is a place we are willing to intervene but places like Syria are not. Uh, an, an often asked question over the years, Janice, what's your take in this context? That's a very good question, Daniel. Um, part of it is, I think, um, relates to the really clear nature of the Islamists who have taken over in northern Mali. Uh, the pictures that have come out um, of whipping um, women, of, uh, you know, amputating the hands. We've seen pictures of young men with their hands amputated. Uh, there has been a stoning uh, for alleged adultery. Uh, and the record of Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb uh, in kidnapping, they currently hold about eight French citizens hostage, uh, makes it uh, very, very clear that should they take over all of Mali, uh, they would then pose a clear threat to neighboring African governments. And it's this which has mobilized other African states, but frankly, more than other African states. There is an international concern uh, in France and Britain and the United States that a new base for Al Qaeda in the Maghreb not be uh, established. In Syria, and there is, but, but we're dealing with a much smaller resistance, although I personally think this is going to be a long and hard operation. This is a vast area of desert, vast, with a few, relatively speaking, towns. Uh, and it's obvious that uh, if and when the, the intervention force gets organized and pushes northward, uh, militants will leave the towns, uh, flee into the desert, and it's conceivable that any intervention force will be chasing these people in the desert for years. Uh, so this could be a very long, drawn-out intervention. Syria is at the other end of the spectrum. First of all, uh, those who are opposing the Assad regime, much more varied. Uh, there clearly are, is evidence of so-called foreign fighters, um, militants who have come from other part of the Islamic world to join the opposition. Uh, the Saudi Arabians and the Qataris are arming these fighters, so there is that presence. But the opposition is much more diverse, uh, much better institutionalized uh, on the one hand. Secondly, the Syrian government um, has a far more sophisticated military, uh, with an armored core, tanks, with anti-aircraft missiles that can easily shoot down, uh, fixed-wing missiles with scuds that has already been using against its own population, and as we all know, with a considerable stockpile of chemical weapons. So in terms of the military challenge, again, night and day between the two cases. We've actually got another Mali question, uh, this one from Twitter, um, from uh, a user named Ashbox Live. How are Canada's foreign policy interests served by participating in the Mali mission, even if for just logistics support? 
Um, I think there are um, multiple levels of Canadian interest that are engaged here. First is a general interest that Canada shares uh, with others, both in Africa and internationally, in not allowing uh, a government of the kind uh, that the, the forces in the North are to establish and entrench itself. Uh, because the fear is that that will then become a base uh, for subverting other African governments and uh, the Islamic forces that are leading, uh, and I call them really Islamic militant forces, to make very clear uh, that these groups are at one far end of the spectrum here. They've made it very clear. Uh, that they would use uh, their base in Mali uh, as a springboard for action against other African governments around the continent. So that's number one. And that's a shared interest that Canada has. Uh, and we're hearing about it from African governments um, directly. Uh, secondly, um, as I've said, Canada has made a very large investment of development assistance in Mali uh, over the years. Um, it's been um, one of the countries of focus for our development agency. Uh, over $100 million of development assistance has gone in. And there is, I think, a deep sense of regret about this division of Mali, uh, about uh, the aborted kind of democratic path uh, in Mali, and I think Bob Fowler put it quite clearly in an article that he wrote for the Global Mail uh, last week, uh, the strong sense that nobody wants to see Bamako occupied by these forces and all hope of democratic transition uh, gone. So I think it's both. Fair enough. Uh, sticking with Africa, but moving on to some other countries, here um, is uh, another question from Tom from our live chat. And I think this is a, a really interesting one. We hear a lot about the situation in Egypt and Syria, but I don't really hear so much about how things are going in Libya, excluding the Benghazi incident, and Tunisia. Um, so what is your assessment of the situation in those two countries? How are those countries coming along? Well, it's a really interesting question um, from your viewer, and actually quite timely uh, because in Tunisia, it is the anniversary of the uh, Bouazi uh, protests that began, which led to the overthrow of the Tunisian regime. Uh, and it's actually, I think, quite sobering. There were demonstrations yesterday, the day before, and today against the new government that is in place, uh, protesting really uh, in uh, two quite different sets of issues. One is that the economy of Tunisia has not improved, that the unemployment rate has not fallen. And if you remember back, Daniel, that was the original impetus to the demonstrations. Uh, and so what you're seeing on the streets is some disappointment with the performance of the regime. Now, how realistic is this? Uh, to expect the government to be able to turn around the economic situation within a few short years. Uh, in Egypt, it's actually far worse than it is in Tunisia, but it's certainly discouraging that the and, and discouraging for young people in Tunisia that the government has done so little. The second focus of the protest is against um, in, in Ada, which is the the Justice and Democratic Party, uh, which is a what I would consider a very moderate Islamic party. Uh, but nevertheless, people are protesting against restrictions on freedom of the press. Uh, they're protesting against what they consider human rights violations. So you have those who had hoped for a more open, democratic uh, Tunisia taking to the streets now, not dissimilar to what you see in Egypt, to press the government um, to open up further, uh, to do better at democratic governance, to do better at human rights protections. So this, you know, the anniversary is not a celebration of what's been accomplished. Uh, actually, what you're hearing in the streets of Tunis 
um, is a demand for much better performance than the government has actually delivered. So I guess it's fair to say the hopes of the revolution are not yet fulfilled in Tunisia. In Libya, um, we actually had a, a free and fair election, relatively speaking, which is astounding given the lack of institutions. And Libya is the one case in the Arab world uh, where Muslim parties did not win. Nevertheless, what we are hearing and seeing in Libya is still a failure uh, to exert national control over militias. Uh, there is no national army yet. Milit different militias still rule in different cities. Uh, Libya does not have the unemployment problem or the wealth problem that Tunisia has because it is an oil exporting country, but progress in building any kind of meaningful national institutions since the overthrow of Gaddafi has been painfully, painfully slow. Hmm. Well, we've had a lot of great questions today. I'd like to uh, thank Janice Stein, the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs. I hope I got it right this time. You did. Okay, good. Now, at the uh, at the start of our program, you talked ab about um, the how students from the Monk School are fanning out uh, across the the world. Can you tell us a bit about that again as we wrap up? Oh, I, we have, in fact, I think quite a remarkable internship program. Uh, we are the only school which actually requires our students to go and work outside of Canada in between their first and second year. And the Monk School puts an enormous amount of effort and resources both into finding these internships, Daniel, all over the world, and then to supporting our students while they're there. So we have had students in the World Bank, we have students in the Shanghai Institute of Strategic Studies in Shanghai, uh, we have had students in the World Trade Organization, we've had students in NATO in Brussels, uh, and a good part of this story is that uh, some of our students, when they graduate, uh, have done so well as interns that they've actually gone on and gotten full-time jobs in these international institutions. Uh, and they are now forming a vibrant alumni network to help the next graduating class. So really the vision for the school is uh, we want to educate young Canadians who are comfortable, fluent, uh, global in their DNA, as we say it, they move out into the world, bring their professional skills, but then they come back to Canada and they contribute. So they move across that bridge back and forth all the time. And there's a there's a map on your site where, there people, is. where, you, where all your students have been and um, your website is monkschool.utoronto.ca so anybody that's watching would like to find out more about that program or everything else that's going on at the Monk School please check out that site again, monkschool.utoronto.ca. If, if I can add just one brief word, Daniel, your, what you said is very timely uh, because we are now just accepting applications for our next round of students. Uh, so I do encourage everybody to go have a look at the Masters of Global Affairs. Uh, it is truly, I think, an exciting and innovative program for this country. Excellent. Well, um, again, uh, people definitely should check out what's going on at the Monk School. Uh, again, thanks to everybody who submitted questions on uh, a very interesting array of subjects. We appreciate it. Uh, Janice Stein, thank you again for taking part, as always. And uh, my name is Daniel Kitts. I'm a producer here at the Agenda, and uh, we'll hope we hope to see all of you watching uh, on uh, watching our broadcast in the near future again. Thank you.